TG Geeks, episode 114, April 10th, 2017. Cons and Cinderella. Hello and welcome to another webcast from TGGeeks.com where Ben and Keith, the two gay geeks, talk about all aspects of geekdom and nerdery. Sci-fi, comics, film, horror genre, you name it, we talk about it. I'm Keith Lane we're coming to you from TG Squared Studios in lovely Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm Ben Raggington, also coming to you from, it's a rather Oh, kind of lazy, hazy, kind of Sunday, Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. So today we've got uh, two interviews for you, and then we're going to talk about uh, something that we experienced this weekend. So the first interview is Aaron Cooper, Director of Talent Relations with Phoenix Comic Con. We're going to get right to that. And this time we have with us... Aaron Cooper, who is the Director of Talent Relations for Phoenix Comic Con. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so we wanted to have you on because you're the one that talks to all the talent and brings those people in and all <laughs> yes, that all kind the, of neat all stuff. the VIPs. We're going to pick your brain here. We won't ask anything right. that you can't share. But. No, but 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 uh, don't be surprised if uh, during the course of this interview you become our favorite person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We want to be your sure. favorite people. Well, I, yeah, actually, yeah, that actually that will be it. We we will ingratiate ourselves upon you to that where we will become your favorite people. Exactly. Or or le or at least I don't doubt it because you're already you're already halfway there and we've just started the interview, so I don't doubt it. Or, or we'll butter you up so bad that you're gonna like, oh, these guys have just got to go They're away. Too much. They're driving too much. me nuts. Get away from me. Here, take what you want. They're too hungry. <laughs> Anyway, no. so so tell us about who you are, how you came to Phoenix Comic Con, and what it is exactly that Talent Relations does for Phoenix Comic Con. Okay, uh, well, I first became involved with Phoenix Comic Con in 2012. Um, I was messing around on Facebook, just kind of browsing through different different areas, and I stumbled upon. Um, uh, an ad for Phoenix Comic Con and uh, the actress Kristen Bauer, who used to play Pam on True Blood, uh -huh. um, it was her guest announcement. And I'm like, what is this? You know, prior to that, I had never heard of Phoenix Comic Con um, or attended Phoenix Comic Con, and I saw that I had an opportunity to meet Kristen Bauer, and I was like, I have to do this. So as I was continuing to read through her post, I saw that they were hiring for uh, volunteer relations coordinator. So I applied for that position just for the hell of it uh, I got the job and then within a month and a half I was actually promoted to exhibitor manager and I was the exhibitor manager for two years so for 2013 and 2014 um, and I loved it it was great I mean I, I got to work with all the very talented and uh, you know artists and the, and the vendors that bring all of the different you know things that they sell and they create and they make. And I mean, it was a blast. I had so much fun. Um, in that course of time, though, um, I got married and had a baby. And then I found out that I was pregnant again. I have uh, two children, a two-year-old and a three-year-old, they're 13 months apart. Oh, my gosh. So when I, I know, when I found out I was pregnant with my son, uh, I called Matt and I said, Matt, you know, I, I, I can't do this. I said, I, I, I don't have, it wouldn't be fair to me and it wouldn't be fair to you. You know, I don't have the time to devote to being exhibitor manager anymore. And so he said, well, you don't have to leave. You know, where do you want to go? And I said, well, acting is my passion. So how about it, guest relations? And so he said, done. And at that point on, I became a handler um, for the guest relations department. And so that's basically where you're, kind of like uh, a personal assistant for an actor for the weekend or a right, guest. Right. Um, and that's what I've been doing 
uh, up until then with the convention, and then uh, I saw the job posting for Director of Talent Relations, and I applied, and I got the job, and here I am. Ta-da! Well, that's cool. So we've probably run across you. I, I, you probably, we probably have seen you. I'm, I'm sure, sure we, have. we have seen you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you've been part of the organization since 2012, there's a good chance that we've actually seen each other. I have, and you know, I never forget a face either, and I'm oh, not dear. exaggerating one bit, so as soon as I see you, I, I will be able to tell you, yes, I recognize you. Oh, okay. okay. So what is it um, that... But... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was uh... going to say, I didn't get around to the last part of the, the question. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Talent relations. Um, so talent relations is formerly known as guest relations. Uh, it's basically the department within the convention that is responsible for providing a superb guest experience for all of the invited guests that we bring out to the convention. So whether it's, you know, a media guest like an actor or a voice actor or an author or a comic creator, a comic writer, a comic artist, any sort of invited guest, um, we are responsible for making sure they have, you know, a great time at the convention from start to finish. So that means um, for the out-of-state folks, as soon as we have, uh, you know, a car picks them up from the airport, uh, they bring them to their hotel, and we're on, we're on stage from then to make sure they have everything that they need, um, escort them to where they need to go, uh, if they have panels or photo ops, um, and just basically show them some really nice, genuine hospitality and a good time while they're visiting in Phoenix, and, uh, you know, just make sure that they are happy, because if they are happy, they will want to come back, and then they'll tell their friends. And uh, that's, that's what we're all about. We're just about providing a quality guest experience, making the guests happy, which in turn make the attendees happy, and that's what we do. Cool. That sounds like a really fascinating job. So you deal with all of the agents and the, the this person and the personal assistants you, yeah, and you the, do, that person. Yeah, you deal with the, all of the, the you, people. You get, you get through all the red I, tape. <laughs> I do. I deal with all of them, and actually a lot of wives, to tell you the truth. I deal with an awful lot of wives who manage uh, the the appearances for their husbands, more so in the comic guest area, but they're all really great. Um, I've, I've gotten to meet, you know, to know a lot of them over, you know, since I've taken over this position, and, and they're all really great. So a lot of booking managers, yes, agents, wives, assistants, um, the whole nine. Wow. That's a that's fascinating, and and I'm sure it's a huge job. You've just got seven million things coming at you all at once. Uh, it is the uh, you know, but it, you know, it's not it's nothing that I can't handle. But I'm lucky now because you know I, I'm sure you are very well familiar with by now the uh, transition we uh, gone through going from volunteers to an mm -hmm. all paid staff. So up until just recently, I've pretty much been a uh, one-woman department, but now <laughs> I have two of my managers on board, Yay. and uh, they are helping me out, and I'm going to be doing interviews this week and ne next week, uh, filling the positions for my entire department. So I've been busy doing that, and I also actually run uh, social media for the Melting Pot Restaurants of Arizona as well. Oh, oh my. wow. That's interesting. So, uh, given the the number of guests that come to Comic Con, and this year again, you know, it's no exception. I mean, I'm we saw it last year, and we're seeing it again this year. It's just this, it's a plethora of special guests that will be appearing at Comic Con. How far in advance do you start planning this? Uh, well, really, I've already started booking and confirming guests for our 2018 lineup. Um, oh my so lord! I'm in my position because we only we we have phoenix comic-con which is the largest convention that we they, we run but we also have several other conventions too so i'm simultaneously uh securing guests for all of the con all of the conventions and so i'm i guess there isn't really a too soon or not too soon it's just from the get-go you just you know i came on board um i started getting as many guests as i could from you know for phoenix comic-con and um, I didn't, my official start date was January 9th. And so, you know, I gave myself a week uh, where I worked solely with, with Matt Solberg. And I, I called it Solberg 101 because he just sat here with me in the, in the conference room and, and really took the time to explain everything and, and show me the ropes. And I was very grateful for that. Um, but I didn't really get invitations out until a week after that. And so more so in any area the comic guests actually book their appearances 
anywhere from 10 months to a year in advance. So wow. that is one thing that I learned very quickly. So as I was starting to announce, or I'm sorry, invite these uh, various comic guests to 2017 Phoenix Comic Con, um, if they were already booked, I'd say, okay, you know, I totally understand, but how about, you know, 2018 or, you know, we're, uh, you know, we have Minnesota Fan Fest coming up. So I've already started booking uh, 2018 to answer your question. Wow, that's that's incredible. That's now, just a full time job doing that. No I'm kidding. Imagine. Now, right. Keith, Keith, you had told me that there was something that, that a question that had popped into your head yesterday, and that was about scheduling conflicts. Oh yes, yes. I I wanted to ask because I know that last year uh, Phoenix Comic Con competed with was it Dallas. Oh, it competed uh, this, with three. Oh, there were three. There actually, there were three on that weekend. There three was, other conventions, and was, they were there was all, Dallas and uh, DC. And New, I, I don't know, but they were all under the same corporate umbrella. Yeah. So, so are, they, are we uh -huh. competing with anybody this year for guests? Wise, uh, yes. We're all. Uh, no matter where you go, I mean the the. the Pop culture convention or the, the Comic-Con scene is it, such a huge industry right now, and, and, and it's changing, you know, so much, and it's becoming so – it's involving so many different pieces and so many different parts that it's just – you're going to run into that no matter what – what weekend of the year you're on, you're going to face competition for another convention. Christmas um, weekend. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the two main conventions I, are not necessarily competitors, but the, I, will, I will say the two other conventions that are also happening over Memorial Day weekend um, are MegaCon in Orlando, Florida, and Alamo City in Texas. Uh -huh. So what kind of... Uh, enticements do you have to offer? Uh, it, it, does it become like a bidding war in order to, to get guests? <laughs> yeah, and, or do you steal guests from somebody? <laughs> uh, well, I like to think that it's my charming personality, <laughs> but <laughs> um, really what it is is it, it's all about uh, people skills and networking and really just building solid relationships with a lot of the booking managers and guests. Um, and, you know, they're going to want it to make sure that their client experiences a fantastic, you know, time at whichever convention they book them. And, I mean, that's their job. So, more than not, they're going to want to go with the person that they know they can depend upon, the person that is going to show them, you know, the red carpet treatment and just give them an overall excellent experience. And so, there have been several times, um, one in particular, where one of the booking managers that I had started building a relationship with um, since I took over, uh, she said, you know, her guest is, is a, one of our big guests that we've already announced this year. And she said, you know, Aaron, he had five other offers, not including Phoenix Comic Con. You were the sixth. But I told him we're going to Phoenix because I know that, you know, Aaron and her team are going to deliver a great time. And that's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. So it's about, you know, building those relationships and more so delivering upon your promises. They know I have a great work ethic and they know that my team here and they've all, and we have a great reputation for taking care of our guests. So that part was already completed for me as well. Um, but one of the things that I started this year that to my knowledge hasn't been done at any, any of the previous years is I actually went in with the head of uh, Megacon, and we are actually sharing Charlie Cox, who is Daredevil, on ah, uh, the Netflix uh -huh. TV series. So we went in on half these, I suppose you could say, and uh, we got together and said, hey, you know, uh, he has a, a pretty large guarantee, and it includes an international flight on top of everything else. So, you know, why don't we just work together to bring him out? So we are splitting the costs down the middle, and he gets a day with Charlie Cox, and we get a day with Charlie Cox, and everybody's happy. And in the money that I'm saving, you know, on, on only having to pay half of this guarantee, for example, it frees up my budget so that I, I can maybe bring out, you know, one to two additional guests that we weren't intending on bringing out before, if that makes sense. It does. Oh, that's great. That I, so I wondered why. And that's why. That's, that's why I said let's not use the word competitor because, 
you know, if we can find a way to work together to enrich the experience for our attendees, because ultimately that's what it's about, then let's do it. So that's what I that's what I did with Charlie Cox this year. Absolutely. Yeah, we wondered, we saw that his his time was limited here and we wondered if there was some filming or something else. So but that explains that. So it looks like I, I just wanted to say it looks like we have kind of a a Defenders, Daredevil kind of lineup <laughs> there going. Yeah, with uh, I, I, I Charlie, I, John Burns. I hesitate to ask this. Are you this. fishing? Are you fishing? I hate. The, yeah, I hesitate to ask the question because you're gonna, you're not going to tell me anyway. But <laughs> it, it looks interesting. It it looks promising. Let's put it that way, and we'll be surprised well, when well, it does happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that I started off in in mind with a daredevil a daredevil group in mind. I will say that. So three three large characters from Daredevil is what my original intentions uh, were. Uh, kind well, of the method four. Method. But <laughs> you know, who knows? I'm not done with just announcing. Exactly. Yet, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, who are the four? I can only well, think of three I mean, at the moment. Well, there's John Bernthal. No, there's only three. So, is, okay. Well, it, but it, with, okay, with John Bernthal, you got Charlie Cox, and you got the actor who plays Foggy. Yeah. And, and who else? Alvin Hansen. Neil McDonough. He's not Daredevil. Oh. He's Legion of He's He's uh, Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, oh, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I was, that's I was DC. Thinking, I was I was thinking of Vincent Dunn. D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio. That's who. D'Onofrio. Oh my God, that would have been I, that would have been yeah, that would have brought the roof down. I, you know, I thought about that, and, and there's still a slight possibility, but I, I, I actually, he was, I went to Emerald City this year, and he was there uh, as well, so. Yeah, that, that's what, who I was thinking of ah. when I saw his name, and it's like, oh, uh, anyway, silly me, I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> There so are comic shows, book right? fans who are just like they're spinning. They're, they're spinning it's like he mixed up DC with Marvel. <laughs> oh, they're spinning no. in their future grave. <laughs> How dare he? Yeah, it looks like you really have a good lineup of of great guests this year. I mean, n not that there hasn't been in the past, but I mean, there's some sure. really incredible guests that that you have this there's, year. There's got to be a starting point where you, I mean, it, obviously there's like a, a a wishing pool, shall we say, of you know, wouldn't it be great if we could get this, this person, mm -hmm. or these people? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you must have some kind of like little fantasy, you know, uh, a fantasy list. Is that is that how it all kind of starts? Um, well, there's a couple of different factors that go into the strategy behind the guests that we invite to bring out to the convention. Um, some of it, like you said, is is a wish list and, you know, a, a gut intuition feeling with, you know, hey, I think that this guest would really would really be a fantastic addition to our guest lineup um, and would really appeal to you know a wide variety of, of people because ultimately what we want to do is we don't just want to stay within the confines of you know maybe just uh, the people who normally uh, come to Comic Con while we while we want those attendees don't get me wrong we want to also open it up to to bring people into this this you know whole different world. Uh, that you know would never think of coming to a, a Comic Con before, and lo and behold, you know we get a guest, and they're like, "Wow, you know, I didn't know they were coming." Kind of like me with the Kristen Bauer at first, and I, I had no idea what Phoenix Comic Con was, but I wanted to meet this guest, and so that's how I became involved in Phoenix Comic Con, and, and here's where I am. I mean, uh, my job ultimately too is about helping everyone quote-unquote, discover their inner geek, and the way that I can do that the best is by appealing to as many as many uh, varieties and demographics of people that, that I can. Um, so there's the wish list. Um, it's not only my wish list, but I have a team of consultants, if you will, um, representative of comic guests and authors uh, and media guests, which we refer to as the actors. Um, so there's that. Uh, there is a place on the website where people can submit their their um, their wish list. You know, right. I want to see so and so for this. You know, Comic Con that would be great. We do get all those and we go through them. Um, but the other half of that equation is uh, analyzing data and trends and looking to see. W you know, what are the top shows? What are people wanting to to see? I mean. Uh, Matt sends out, we write, you know, these different surveys that we send out all the time, and um, it's basically, you know, what's your favorite show? Or, you know, we phrase the question 
we've rephrased several of the questions um, specifically with the intent to make sure that our data that we collect is, is you know, consistent and accurate, an accurate representation, but we really analyze the data backwards and forwards and with a fine tooth comb to make sure that we are getting what people truly want to see. So uh, that's, that's fascinating, the, the way that you do that. Of course, there's, there's always the pool of, I'm sure, the, the ones that will, will always say yes when Phoenix Comic Con mm -hmm. asks. And, and then I forgot one other piece, too. There are also the times where the booking agents will come to me and say, hey, guess what? Um, so and so just became my client, and you know I told them about Phoenix Comic Con and or she and how they're going to have a great time, and you know why don't we try it out this year, and you know we'll make it you know a low guarantee or a reasonable guarantee, and and it's it's a great deal that works out for everyone all around. So that's the other the other piece to that as well. When when booking managers bring me uh, ideas or suggestions. Well, that's even better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is there anybody that? Uh, just, you know, pie in the sky, like, oh, this, this person I would love to get. Just, I mean, you know, just, just, just for fun. Like my personal preference or, or just in general? Both. <laughs> okay. So my personal preference, uh, and, and this is just me. I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't by in any way, shape, or form uh, invite guests just because I want to see them. Um, you know, I take myself well, out of the not? equation, <laughs> and I try to get everyone else's, you know, input and think of the attendees first and foremost. But I think uh, someone that would be really cool to have uh, actor-wise would be uh, Winona Ryder, actually, because – she, you know, she's doing Stranger Things right now, which is becoming a cult hit phenomenon in itself. Right. But she's also done so many other cult classics that people really like. I mean, there's Heathers and people like, you know, Edward Scissorhands mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Pump Up the Volume. We could get Christian Slater and Winona Ryder and do like a Heathers reunion or something. Oh, um, wow. So that um, I have a lot of a lot of comic guests that I, I really am going after. I mean, first and foremost on that list will probably be Jim Lee. So I am uh, determined mm -hmm. to have him out. And then uh, just author, my wise, my favorite or my top number one get would be Stephen King. Oh wow, yeah, Ooh. that would be incredible. That's that <laughs> well, would be I'm, a grab. I'm working on that. I already have a strategy in place <laughs> that has begun already. So so that's, you that's gotta, in the works. You got to keep. Keep at that one, you know. Absolutely. Never take never take no for an answer. <laughs> nope. And I, I think of all possible angles that I can to to try and, and and you know get to that person or or you know have them know what a great convention Phoenix Comic Con is mm -hmm. and how they'll have a great time. And hey, why are why haven't we gone to Phoenix? What have we been doing? I mean, Stephen King. That is a lofty goal, uh, just because he doesn't like to do very many conventions or appearances, for that matter. Right. Um, but you know, I am, I am. I mean, that is my ultimate goal, and I am looking into other areas. Like he has a, a son who writes as well, uh, Joe Hill. So he's something to look, you know, a, a potential candidate to bring out to add to our author's lineup. Um, yeah. But well, and that you know, could be an my, end to bringing Stephen King out. <laughs> exactly. He there you has go. See, I I got to figure it out. I'm all, well, it's I'm not right just, on top of that. It was not just that, but you know, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, people, they live in places of the country where, uh, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, eight months down the road, have have them come out to a fan fest and use one of the big things is, we've got the best winters. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If you want to escape the cold. <laughs> Come to Phoenix. It'll be 75 degrees and sunny. But the summers yeah. are so terrible. But it's air conditioned Phoenix. inside. <laughs> <laughs> I, know you, uh, I know you spoke with Kristen Rowan, who's right. our marketing manager, yesterday. And I don't know if the subject of FanFest was brought up. But for Phoenix FanFest, we are, uh, you know, we're changing it a little bit. So it's going to have more of a nostalgic feel to it. Um, mm. It's not going to be, you know, prior... The last year and the year before that, uh, it was sort of referred to as, as a mini Phoenix Comic Con, but now we're going for more of a collector's feel, a nostalgic factor. So a lot of my guest lineup that I bring out for Phoenix Fan Fest 
are going to be, you know, the media guests and the actors that are maybe from, you know, iconic shows from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s. Oh, so it's wow. More oh, of see, that's, that's where we grew out. up. Yeah, Gil Gerard and Aaron Gray, they're always doing appearances together, plus they actually have a legitimate business helping uh, uh, as, as agents of sorts. And so, you know, there you've got, your, there's, you got your Buck Rogers and your Wilma Deering. Sir, yep, and I actually am bringing out. Uh, Aaron's company is called Heroes uh, for Hire, and I am I am bringing out uh, a couple of her clients this year for Phoenix Comic Con as well. Cool. So um, I I note I didn't notice in the press release, and we didn't say anything about it yesterday. Uh, is is the Fan Fest going to be at the convention center, or is that still kind of up in the air? Uh, yes, it's going to be at the convention center. Okay, great. It didn't say. We assumed it was, but it was like, uh, so I, we didn't say anything in our article or, you know, yeah, in, in anything that we published about that. So it was huh? so like, okay, well, we better ask. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the convention yeah, center but... is a great place for it. It's just unbelievable. So, yeah, we like it. I I have a great time there, and, and their staff is, is really nice and on top of their game, and they're very helpful. So so we do have, oh, it's the question. It's the, the big taboo question we need to ask now. We can ask that okay, one. I'm we'll ready. ask that one afterwards. Ask it later? Yeah. Just. Okay. Okay, fine. We'll ask yeah. it later. So, yeah. all right. So then, then let, me, let me go with this then. Um, would you, you would classify yourself as a geek. I mean, you, you're talking about... Uh, Kristen, uh, was it Kristen Bauer? Uh, so would you, would you c consider yourself to be uh, a geek? Absolutely. I, I am, um, there's, I have little mini obsessions about different uh, movies and actors and fandoms, and I am a huge Lord of the Rings junkie. Huge. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Oh, you're talking to yes. two people who will definitely get along with you. <laughs> yes. Yes, we're yeah we're we're big yeah. big Tolkien fans. I read Lord of the Rings in 1972. I read it in 76. <laughs> nice. Not well, that. you know, as a matter of fact, the current exhibitor manager, her name is Kelly Ambrosia, and when I was exhibitor manager, I actually hired her um, in a coordinator position. And when she came in for the interview, she sat down and I said is that an Elvis tattoo you have? And she's like, wow, you know that? I'm like, oh, yes, I know that. <laughs> so, yes, I, I am I am a geek. Yes, I, I, I am proud to admit that, yes. You recognize your, uh, was, was it was it Sindarin or was it uh, Kenyon? The, 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 the script. <laughs> so, I am impressed. Look at you. And, oh, and my, 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 my brother, his, his old, and every, I swear, every, at least it feels like a couple times a month, he's, he's with us. Did you get Elijah Wood yet? Have you booked Elijah Wood? Oh my yet? word! Have you booked oh Elijah my Wood God. Yet? <laughs> well, we know who he wants to have come to the yeah. con. We do, we do, because he likes Tolkien as well. He likes Lord of the Rings too. That's cool. So then, uh, was Tolkien your gateway drug into the geek world? Um, you know, I kind of, I would, I would probably say yeah. You know, because I read that when I was fairly young. That and then uh, I kind of, I read Bram Stoker's Dracula when I was 10 as well. Oh, that's yeah. that's I heavy. Immediately... Yeah. Oh, what a yeah, tome that yeah. thing is. Yeah. That and Frankenstein, both are just Those, tomes. Yes. Just, oh, my God, yeah. impossible I mean, to get I, uh, through. <laughs> it's like I Beowulf. Vampires. Yeah. It, it's like re re trying to read Beowulf. I mean, it, it's the Odyssey. It, it's it's Homeric hymns. I mean, it's my word, it, it's huge. It's War and Peace. <laughs> And they may have something to do with the fact that my degree is in English literature. I don't know. Ah, but, um, I, I see. Did. I, just, yeah. I, I loved it. And then, you know, ever since then, um, I, when I was 10, Bram Stoker's Dracula and the movie JFK were pivotal, pivotal, pivotal excuse me, moments in my life um, that really just, for whatever reason, I just l latched on and just kind of never let go. Uh, Gary Oldman became one of my favorite actors. He's mm -hmm. in both JFK and Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, my daughter's name is Kennedy. I still like vampires. I still love all of that. So, well, let me let me do a little shameless plug here about uh, vampires. You know, uh, okay. and you, I know that Kristen has talked to Arizona Opera, but you know they're doing Hercules versus the Vampires, which is an opera mm -hmm. that is it takes the 
uh, Mario Bava film from, was it 63, Hercules and the Underworld with Christopher mm-hmm. Lee, and they've set it to music, and they've set the dialogue to music, and it they've turned it into an opera. But Arizona Opera is doing that in October, and we're kind of looking to, you know, a little bit have of, a, a little tie-in. I've been cross-pollination, I've been, uh, communicating with Arizona Opera on that little committee to do opera con beforehand, and uh, you know, do the all that stuff. But it's about vampires. Uh, the Mario Bava film. It's a horrible film. Oh, it's, it's just, such it's, a it's trashy terrible. piece of. Mo- <laughs> it, it's a trashy film, but the opera music will only make it better. Yep. So that, to check that, that out. That sounds great. Yeah, it, and it, then that makes me think of Anne Rice too. She's on my wish list as well. Ah, her son would also be another one too, Christopher. Christopher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he's also well, very we, big. Uh, for the first year, or I'm sorry, uh, this year for 2017, uh, we've actually switched book vendors. So our book vendor this year is going to be changing hands. So we oh. are developing a partnership with them going forward. So I'm really excited about that. Oh, cool! Oh, it's nice that you get get them involved. It's, I mean. Having it, I, I guess you could call them the sort of the big mom and pop store. Yeah, here in, mm-hmm. in the valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's that's a really reputable chain. So bravo to that. Well, and it's nice to support local too. You yes. Know, so the local independent bookstore. Absolutely, we're we're huge supporters of independent creators. I mean, it's like we've we've given money to several films that are, you know. Uh, being created uh, as well as you know this and that and the other Mm -hmm. so independent creators whether they're comic books or film or you know whatever whatever we 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 like to support support that and we we really we try to talk to as many as we can Mm -hmm. so good for you so for people who want to know more about what's going on with phoenix comic-con uh they want to know more about guests etc uh, is there a link? Is there some kind of uh, social media presence? Or if somebody wants to reach out to you, how could they? If, is that possible? How can they do that? <laughs> yes. Well, wow, that was like ten questions in a row. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, let me let let me start. Uh, with, yes, uh, there. I am absolutely available. Uh, there should be a link on the website. At, it's just www.phoenixcomiccon.com. Um, and you, I'm, there should be a link to my email address there. In addition, I mentioned earlier, there is a spot on the website where you can go and place your guest request. I receive all of those, um, so you can reach me there. Um, but to answer your question, if you want to learn more about Phoenix Comic Con or really the fastest way to stay in the know, um, and one that I would recommend actually is to follow us on social media, particularly Facebook, because Kristen and I, uh, Kristen Rowan, again, the marketing manager, we are teaming up this year and really putting together some awesome uh, marketing pr- promotions with a lot of the guests that we have attending. So um, one of the new things we started this year is Facebook Live sessions. So far, we've done one with uh, Karen David, she was our first one, and then we had one with uh, Supernatural's Ostrich Chell, and they log in through our account and they hold a Facebook Live session, and it's really fun because it, it, it gives them, it gives their attendees, or anyone for that matter, um, you know, just all they have to do is go to our page. We announce when we're gonna do, you know, when we have one coming up, but uh, you just, it's so easy. You just log on and you just watch, and. Uh, you know, they tell, they talk, they tell stories. It's it's basically like a, a real time panel or a Q and A session, and it's really fun. So we have a lot of those lined up and in the works, plus some additional surprises uh, that we haven't revealed yet. But uh, you know, Facebook is and social media is a really fun way to constantly just be in the know because our guest announcements will go there first before they're listed up on our website, um, and we have a lot of contests that are coming up and just. All sorts of neat things. So I would definitely recommend following us on social media, particularly Facebook. Well, that's great. Well, th- thank you, Aaron, for being with us on the show. Aaron sure. Cooper, the Director of Talent Relations for Phoenix Comic Con. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniela Mack. I am a mezzo soprano singing Cinderella at Arizona Opera, and you are listening to the Two Gay Geeks. <laughs> Thank you. 
Here's a few selected birthdays for April 10th through April 16th, 2017. April 10th, Max von Sydow and Haley Joel Osmond and Harry Morgan. April 11th, Joel Gray, who came out as gay recently, yes, too. Uh, like Barry Manilow. Yeah. Like, like no one knew. Exactly. Also, uh, April 11th, Oleg Cassini. April 12th, Montserrat Caballé, fam famed opera singer. Also, David Cassidy, Maria Callas. Another um, famed opera um, another singer. Another famed opera singer. Tiny Tim. Another famed uh, opera singer. Uh, well, uh, another famed singer. <laughs> singer. Uh, singer. And Ann Miller. Who's, Who's Ann Miller? Miller? Leave, Leave this, this house. house. Yes. <laughs> A famed dancer. Uh, dance. Uh, yeah, dancer. Yeah. Yeah. April 13th. Eric Avari, Bonnie Yuen. Bonnie Way. Yeah, anyone know what that's from? If you do, leave it in the comments. Don Adams of... Get Smart. Get Smart. Or Get Dumb. Well, or, if you're talking about him. Yeah. <laughs> and also on April 13th, Ron Perlman, Peter Davison, and Ricky... Or should we say... Rick. Rick Schroeder. Rick, don't call me Ricky Schroeder. <laughs> exactly. April 14th, Claire, Claire Coffee. Claire Coffee, our, yeah. our favorite Hexen Beast. Yes, and we would love to talk to Claire Coffee again. Yes, very uh, much so. Very much so. April 14th, also Sir John Gilgood. April 15th, Emma Watson, Elizabeth Montgomery. Wow, two witches. Yeah, and uh, Le Leonardo da Vinci in 1452. And what was the, it says... This is a fake. Yes. In felt tip. <laughs> In felt tip pen. Yes. April 16th, Henry Mancini and Charlie Chaplin was born in 1889 and Wilbur Wright in 1867. And that's it for the birthdays this time. This is Kenny Rotter from the Dumbbells and Dragons podcast, where nerd and fitness collide. Join me and a guest every Wednesday for a new episode where we talk about all things nerdy, pop culture, and health and fitness. Follow me on all social media at Dumbbells Dragon, or just search Dumbbells and Dragons. Workout nerd out. Go give a listen to our friend Kenny over at Dumbbells and Dragons. Scratch that. Scratch. Scratch. Scratch that. We'll catch up on feedback next week. That sounds like a good I idea. A, I need a scratch sound. A scratch sound? <laughs> yeah, there we go. You know, next time, we, if we ever should buy ourselves a, a USB turntable, well, I'm sure you can find a soundbite. Yeah, I can find a soundbite. Soundbite yeah. for that. I'm so, I'm certain someone's got that, you know, scratchy yeah, sound. Exactly. Or, or a needle going across the LP. <laughs> yep, exactly. So if, if you want to leave a comment, please leave a comment, but please play nice. Uh, you can leave comments on Facebook page, TG Squared Studios, or at tggeeks.com, or you can leave a voicemail, 469-TG-GEEKS. That's 469-844-3357. Hi, I'm Alex Schrader, and I'm singing the role of Don Ramiro, a.k.a. Prince Charming, in Rossini's La Cenerentola, a.k.a. Cinderella, at Arizona Opera, and you are listening to The Two Gay Geeks. <laughs> And in our second segment here, we have a second interview. We have Matt Solberg with Phoenix Comic Con. Mm -hmm. He's the convention director. So we're going to play that, and then we're going to talk afterwards. So here's Matt's interview. And this time we have a real treat for you. We have the convention director of Phoenix Comic Con, Mr. Matt Solberg. Welcome to the show, Matt. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so tell us uh, a little bit about your history with Phoenix Comic Con. Obviously, it, the history of Phoenix Comic Con is your history with Phoenix Comic Con. But just give us a real brief uh, history of Phoenix Comic Con and, and what maybe you were doing before you started Phoenix Comic Con and what, what do we have to look forward to this year? 
Well, absolutely. So I, like many others, grew up reading comic books. And when I was 15 and 16 years old, started attending uh, local conventions, uh, primarily in the the Twin Cities where I was growing up, uh, to sell excess comics I had and just stuff I wasn't reading anymore. Uh, my parents would pack up the uh, the station wagon and would drive me uh, to the shows. And these were pretty much one-day flea markets, if you were. Uh, years later, uh, having gone to college and having a, a career after that, I uh, had moved to the Phoenix area and was just looking for something else to do, uh, something that wasn't uh, related to what my job was at the time, which was working on political campaigns. And uh, just sort of harkened back to uh, my youth and my teenage years of, of being in high school and thought, well, geez, maybe I should get back into comic books somehow. Uh, and at this point, it had been a few years since I had even read a comic book, and I did not even know if there were still conventions around. And for me, that was the light bulb moment. Uh, that was uh, the, the moment that I was like, well, actually, that would be the thing to do, would be to, to organize a convention. Uh, it harkens to uh, – it's got parallels with the career that I was doing, uh, working on political campaigns. You are persuading people to take a specific action, uh, voting, uh, on a specific day. Uh, right. on election day exactly. and attending a convention or any event is very similar to that you're persuading people to purchase a ticket to attend this event on a specific day and put my my money where my mouth was at and that was june of 2002 with the first phoenix comic-con wow. uh, attendance was a little over 400 at the time and in the years since we've grown to over a hundred thousand people and uh, to say you know what is going to be new and what's going to be different uh, every year uh, we take feedback from attendees, both uh, items that we hear during the show, uh, stuff that we read online, uh, and we also have attendees complete a post-convention attendee survey. And we take sort of all of that and say, all right, where, you know, where are we able to make improvements, what needs to get improved, and there's always long-term projects as well that we work on and it finally comes to fruition, you know, two or three years after having that first idea. Wow. Uh, as we look at 2017, uh, you know, one of the improvements that we've made, which is already in effect, is the ability for attendees to order their, their tickets, order their badges, and have those badges mailed to them. Yeah, that's you know, a prior, huge thing. That's what we're hoping. Um, and it's, and it's not just having the ticket mailed to you. It is your actual badge, and it's a lanyard. Oh, ah, nice. So cool. to actually get it, you know, and to have it prior to the show, which means you won't have to go to registration. Right. You know, you've just saved that amount of time. Exactly. And we did have issues on Friday of last year with registration. And while uh, those issues were solved, uh, this whole idea of being able to order and have your badges mailed to you uh, just makes it so much easier. Oh yeah, you know? and yeah. we'll we'll save people time. Yeah, we we were kind of sauntered over on Last Thursday year, yeah. Thursday morning. We thought we had some breakfast, and we said, "Oh, oh well, we'll, we'll, we'll see if there, we there. you know go over about you know eight thirty. Maybe they might some you know yeah, people might start lining up. Like, oh my holy word! Holy moly! How many people can be in line on a Thursday morning at eight o'clock? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was kind of crazy. Just the whole you know registration process, uh, and and I I'm glad that you have have looked at that and kind of worked through that. That That's a really cool deal. I think a lot of and people are going to see that that's a, a major uh, thing. that you Major time saver. Yeah. And that's what we're hoping. And, uh, you know, this point forward, if you purchase, it's automatic. It will be mailed to you. Uh, prior to us making that change uh, in February, um, there was a good number of people who uh, had purchased, uh, but it wasn't a part of the, the, the program to have it shipped. Uh, there's there's additional shipping charges involved. So they're getting the option to be able to purchase shipping to have their badges mailed. And I imagine that there will be some people who just won't. Uh, right. You know, they don't want to spend a few dollars extra. And I got a hunch that what will happen is they'll come on site and they'll be hanging out. You know, they'll be arriving with their friends and their friends will say, well, we already have our badges. Right. right? Mm -hmm. like we're, we're we want to go to this go. panel. <laughs> right. You know. Uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you later, 
uh, who's needing to go and wait in line uh, at registration. Yeah. Uh, and even, uh, you know, tying in with, you know, that sort of operational change of having your badges mailed to you uh, were a couple of other improvements that were all kind of tied together. One is our website is finally mobile friendly. Yep. Thank that's you. Been a challenge for <laughs> us, yeah, the last few years. Uh, it was sort of not really mobile friendly. Uh, <laughs> and when we made this change, uh, everything was all just tied together uh, with our registration system. So when we were changing one, it became very easy uh, to change the other. So mm -hmm. a mobile friendly website. Cool. And what uh, ties in even additionally with that is we will have a uh, very robust and fully functioning app. Okay, yeah, uh, I was going to ask on. about that. Cause That's they, uh, what I was really hoping I for. I know they, they talked about that, uh, redoing the app uh, at the, yeah. the post-mortem last year. So. Yeah, uh, again, that's one of those where we've had something that kind of sort of works sometimes. And uh, the app that we're using, we had tested it at our uh, Halloween theme show back in the fall. And had great feedback. It worked well, and so now we're able to roll it out. Cool uh, for for the big show. That's great. So, what are you looking forward to about the uh, the con this year? Well, for me, I think my interest is always a little bit different than most attendees. Uh, there's always a handful of guests I do get excited to see, uh, being a fan myself. But where uh, sort of where I sit within my position, it's making sure everything runs smoothly. So when everything when everything runs smoothly and when people rise to the challenges that they have, uh, you know, those, those staff members uh, and panelists and guests, uh, when everything is just kind of moving along right. and everything is where it should be and everything is working, that's what I get really excited about. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of guests uh, that uh, we've announced, uh, again, there's always a handful that I get excited to say, yeah, you know, like that's somebody I'm going to get a photo op with um, or, you know, that's a creator that I want to make sure I get some autographs from. That's cool. So uh, I, I will say that uh, when you talk about people rising to the challenge and, and when things kind of go a little awry, you are always right there. You know, when you find out about it, you're always right there trying to solve it, trying to figure it out, trying mm -hmm. to do something about it. And you're not kind of a the uh, absent, you know, convention director, shall no. we say. So I appreciate that, and thank you for, for always doing that. I appreciate the comment. Uh, the compliment. I, 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 in terms of uh, Phoenix Comic Con, I seem to remember a conversation some years ago, maybe it was during the open house, that you didn't want Phoenix Comic Con to necessarily be a mirror of, like, San Diego Comic Con or... Uh, uh, has there been any kind of uh, a coalescing uh, of ideas as to what we want Phoenix Comic Con to, to grow into? Well, I think in many ways it's already grown into that. When you look at what a San Diego Comic Con is, which is you know very much a media-driven show with a little bit, a little hint of, of its comic background, you know, there, it's just not possible for us to become that type of show. Uh, and some of that is just the relationship San Diego Comic-Con has with those movie studios. Um, those movie studios go to San Diego Comic-Con specifically because of the San Diego Comic-Con, and it has become that sort of media-centered universe as it is. Uh, when we look at what you know, Phoenix Comic-Con offers, and, and more specifically when we look at what it is our attendees are interested in, and for, from surveys what we find is that about a fourth of our attendance comes out simply to shop in the exhibitor hall. Like that is the number one thing for them to do. So for us, it's about making sure that we've got uh, as diverse of an exhibitor hall as we can and ideally as spacious of one as possible. Uh, and in talking about another improvement is up on the third floor where we've had uh, the costuming groups and the celebrities, we have now expanded and we'll have more exhibitors up there as well. 
Uh, so we've been selling booths and tables up there to exhibitors, uh, you know, basically creating a, a secondary exhibitor hall. Wow. Uh, so there's a fourth of our attendees that come out simply to shop. Uh, and then another fourth of our attendees come out for the programming and the content that we offer. You know, that's all the, the panels and activities. To them, that is the number one thing and the, the number one reason why they come out. So for us, it's about looking at what are the events and activities that people are attending and uh, what are the ones that uh, get sort of that most engagement. And again, it's through surveys and it's through attendance counts that we, that we kind of learn that and engage that. And that's also part of the reason why we offer as many different genres as we do. Uh, I, know, I know there are people who wish we were just comic books or mm. people who we were, wish we were just science fiction. Uh, or whatever whatever their genre happens to be the most passionate one that they have. Uh, I've always kind of viewed Phoenix Comic Con as being a big canvas uh, mm -hmm. upon which everybody is able to paint. And, you know, my goal is to make sure that, you know, we're able to offer, you know, sort of as large, uh, sturdy and safe of a canvas as we possibly can. Well, uh, so uh, there's we can the, provide... there's a little ahead. bit of something for everybody. Ideally, yes. Ideally, yeah. I mean, that's that's the goal. Uh, and then, a, and, a, and then a fourth of our uh, attendants do come out because of the guests. You know, they come out because of the celebrities, the actors, the creators. You know, to them that is the number one thing. They want to get that autograph and that photo op and that chance to express their thanks uh, to those individuals for the you know enjoyment and entertainment they've given. Uh, and and then there's a fourth of our attendants that the number one reason why they come out is split between they want to buy convention branded merchandise, uh, they want to see all of the costumes and people watch, uh, and they want to meet others like them. You know, it's very much the, the social engagement. They want to meet others who share a similar passion as them. And I'm sure in some regards this, you know, holds true at other conventions, uh, you know, the percentages might change, you know, the, the numbers of people who go for different different aspects. But for me, when I think uh, about what is it that attendees want from Phoenix Comic Con, it's very balanced. Yeah. You, know, you have people want, who want the exhibitor hall. You want people who uh, they want the programming. They want the guests. You know, they want that social interaction. There's not one that really dominates. Uh, and, you know, for us, it's the case of maintaining that balance. Well, that's cool. Now, I know that uh, you've taken over most of the convention center. What what percentage of the convention center? Not the not the Southport. Oh, not not but, the old one. Yeah, the but, old building. But the new convention center. What what percentage of that? I know you you don't use that big, the big hall, but uh, or the one that has uh, the stadium seating. But uh, for the most part, you're you've got most of the convention center occupied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as percentages, now, if, if you take out the South Building uh, and say just of the North and West, at this point, we're using everything in the North and West Building other than they have some executive conference rooms right. uh, that we just, they're, they're just too small uh, and sort of out of the way for us to really be able to, to utilize. Right. Uh, but we use halls one through six on the lower level. Uh, we use all of the 100 and 200 meeting level rooms along with the ballroom. Uh, we use uh, 301, which is another ballroom up on the third floor. And this year we're also expanding uh, the exhibitor space and using all of halls uh, A through E. Wow. Uh, so we're using everything in the north and the west building. That's incredible. Uh, at some point, we'll, we'll cross the street again, <laughs> and we'll find a way to use that south building. Yeah. Uh, Why not? It's Phoenix Comic Con 2. Yeah. <laughs> We'll figure out a, a reason, right? Yeah. Uh, much like uh, a number of years ago, we had closed Third Street. Right. And, you know, we're able to incorporate that into what we were doing. And then last year, we also closed Adams Street uh, right, near, right. The, uh, near the Hyatt. And we're able to incorporate, you know, programming content into our overall event. Uh, we've, we've learned uh, you really can't force it. Uh, right. There was a year when we had pushed some stuff to the South Building. And it just it was just too much. Uh, and there are expenses in being able to use it. So for us, it's not just a case of, uh, oh, the space is available, let's take it. It's what can we put that, that will drive traffic over there uh, and that attendees will engage with. Right, right. Just got a couple of things. Uh, one, this is something that maybe a lot of people kind of wonder about, and that is, you know, obviously you've got your different uh, departments and your different directors and whatnot. 
Uh, what, what kind of involvement do you have with what they do in putting you know, a Phoenix Comic Con or, or a Fan Fest together? What, what, uh, how, mu- how invested are you in uh, actively uh, with the other departments in terms of getting something like that all put together? It has to have the Matt Solberg stamp of approval. <laughs> Uh, well, fortunately, it does not have to necessarily have the Matt Silver stamp of approval. Uh, you know, my, my goal has always been to hire uh, to hire great people, uh, to mentor them, to train them, and then ultimately to trust them to do their jobs. So uh, I meet with uh, our directors uh, and team managers uh, regularly, um, probably weekly in, in many cases. Uh, we do have formal office space, so it's very easy to, you know, to pop into people's offices and, and to, to chat with them. Uh, you know, for the overall vision, direction of the convention, that originates with me. Uh, and, you know, my job is just to kind of check in with people and make sure, uh, you know, we're, we're tracking, you know, towards that vision. Uh, a lot of day-to-day decisions uh, they have control over. You know, they're able to um, manage their departments and make decisions uh, within certain parameters, uh, you know, for the convention. Uh, you know, additional duties that I sort of see myself having is as they run into obstacles, uh, to be able to help remove whatever those obstacles might be and to make sure that everybody is sort of working well with each other uh, as well as with uh, sort of any company or group uh, external of the convention. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I'm involved, uh, but uh, admittedly you could ask me a, a question about uh, maybe a specific guest or a specific, uh, you know, marketing uh, aspect or a specific, you know, programming topic, and I may not have the answer. You know, right. it's, it's, the convention is too big at this point for any oh, one person gosh, yeah. to know all of the details. Exactly. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Well, that that's good that you you trust the people that you've hired. That that's always important. And it, it helps and for sh- peace of mind for well, you. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> oh yeah. It, it makes it a lot of le- makes it a bit easier for you, and it, I think it helps to make the machine run a little bit better this, without any of the micromanaging. So if people want to know more about Phoenix Comic Con or more about what, what you're doing, uh, is there social media presence? I, do you have social media presence? Uh, I mean, do you, do you personally talk about Comic Con if anybody wants to kind of get your personal take on that? Um, what can you tell us? Uh, so phoenixcomiccon.com uh, is our website, and from that you're going to be able to find links to all of our social media channels. So obviously Phoenix Comic Con has a, a Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I think we even have a Snapchat uh, page uh, as well. Um, myself personally, uh, while I do have a personal uh, Facebook page, uh, I, made a, I maintain a pretty good uh, separation between uh, business and my private life. Uh, and and that's uh, acceptable. Admittedly, I, I don't really talk much about uh, Comic-Con on my, my personal page, uh, if only because uh, I think people probably get uh, enough of it through uh, through our normal page. <laughs> right. Mm. Makes sense. And, and, and just being around you, I would imagine, sometimes, too. <laughs> you need to, yeah, you need to have that line. Yeah, that and that... That's acceptable and, and perfectly understandable. Well, thank you, Matt Solberg, Convention Director for Phoenix Comic Con, for being on our show this time. Thank you once again for having me. I do appreciate it. And that was a kind of a, an interesting little interview that we had with Matt. It was, was not, it was informative. Nice to, it was, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that he was able to take the time out of his busy day because you know with Comic Con coming up, uh, I, he's got to be busy. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, he's got to be yeah. busy. You know, and even though he de- he does a lot of delegating, I mean, he's obviously picked the right people, to, as he said, you know, to to run the different departments. Uh, he's still, I mean, it, it's still got to take up a lot of his time. Absolutely, yeah. So we now we want to transition to something of really, and now for something completely different. Now, for but something not entirely completely different. Completely different, exactly. because you, we just heard the bumper from Alex Schrader. Yeah, and as well as, as Daniela well as his, earlier as well as in Daniela. the episode. Yeah, and we we had the interview that we released on Friday, a special interview episode, uh, where we talked to Daniela and Alec and Joe and, Spector and Joe Spector. And Friday night, we saw both Alec and Daniela sing in center, uh, 
Centerentola. Centerentola. <laughs> Cinderella. <laughs> Cinderella, yes. Cinderella. Gender- and Centerentola. Yes. <laughs> Actually, those uh, operas, will, <laughs> those names will never be the same again. Never. No, never we've again. ruined it for life. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, but in Cinderella or La Cenerentola, as it's referred to in the Italian, mm-hmm. and that's by Rossini. And. What an experience. Uh, Arizona Opera outdid themselves this time. I agree. Th- uh, this was... was uh, I remember uh, the the Saturday morning after we'd seen the Friday night performance with Alec and Daniela and the rest of that cast, I remember we were talking about it and just thinking about what a performance that was. Yes. I mean, I, I just had chills. It was so unbelievably amazing uh the cast i have never heard a, a better balanced cast yeah it was really and great. they used uh quite a few of their own uh studio artists exactly all in fact uh all of the cast on stage uh, other than the chorus uh except for the two principals uh Cenerentola and don romero are all um well, don magnifico the, don Mag- uh, don magnifico the stepfather and and don romero uh, on this performance were uh, from the Young Artist Program. That's right. And so they were really, really, really good. Yes, they were absolutely wonderful. And as we said, uh, there are a number of moments that could really just make or break this opera because yes. for anybody, and Rossini, this this is one of his most pyrotechnical. This one and I think oh, yeah. Barbara Seville yep. are the ones that have the most fireworks in terms of vocal performance. And speaking of Barbara Seville, they're doing that's going to do next year. Week. Yeah, so exactly. I'm very excited to see what they're going to do next season with that and I hope that yeah. I hope some of these casts get to come back. Yeah, they be because great. they were amazing. It was fantastic. But uh they they pulled off every number including our favorite little sex Ted in the final act. Oh my gosh. And it was absolutely brilliant. The staging was brilliant, the production was wonderful. The um, diction was The diction was uh, excellent. In this particular opera, you have to it, it just well, Rossini period, but this particular opera you're uh, Italian diction has to be perfect because he he just he writes this stuff in Italian that r- requires perfect diction to be able to be understood and it makes the music that more satisfying. It has to be more than just precise. Yep, exactly. Uh, and uh, they have to like over exaggerate the pronunciation so that it doesn't sound muddy out to the audience, and yep. yet they can't afford to lose that tempo. Exactly. Uh, if it starts to slow down, and if you fall out of sync with the orchestra, oh my gosh. you know, you're, we're, we're looking at a train wreck. Yeah. And we didn't get any train wrecks. Yeah, and the, the sextet, it, it most assured. <laughs> wow. It was unbelievable. It that was, just was it was incredible. flawless. It, it was, and then we saw it again Saturday yeah, night. Yeah, then we saw it again Saturday night. And, um, in fact, that was the one that everybody except Don Magnifico and... Uh, uh, Don Romero was all young. They're artists all program. young artists. Uh, the girl that played Angelina or Cinderella or Cenerentola was part of the a young artist program, and mm-hmm. she did a she was fabulous remarkable job. I mean, it was another fabulous cast. It was just unbelievable. We saw two almost perfect operas mm-hmm. on two consecutive nights, but. This was by far the best production that we've ever seen Arizona Opera do. And I was, was just thrilled with it. Incredible. I mean, I, I just walked out of there just so unbelievably happy. And it's still running through my head today. Yeah, I haven't gotten... <laughs> yeah, the music was just running through my head all last night. It was running through it this morning. Uh, little bits of it here and there. And so I, I was just thrilled with it. And I'm, I'm saying that this is going to be an indication of things to come. Yes. I think Arizona Opera has just got some great stuff going on down the road. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of you listeners are thinking, well, what's that got to do with geeky stuff? You know, well, as, we, as we always say, you know, you name it, we talk about it. And, and, and as we said during the, the interview we had with Joe, Alec, and Daniela, uh, there are plenty of things about opera. Uh, to geek out about absolutely lots absolutely. of things i mean there's so many things that can be if you open your mind to what can be in an opera i mean mm-hmm. there, there's drama there's horror there's comedy there's it's musical theater mm-hmm. 
uh, just all kinds of things. And just about and any wonderful subject. Wonderful music, wonderful singing. Yeah, just about any subject exactly. is available. Yeah. I mean, L.A. Opera did a, a science fiction opera based on David Cronenberg's The Fly. Yeah. And Howard Shore, if I'm not mistaken, had a hand in the music on that. Yeah, so there's there's really... Just open your mind to, to different things. Open the possibility. Yeah. I mean, there you would you will not be disappointed necessarily. I'm sure that anybody who tries it out can find something about opera to say, "Ooh, that is cool." Yeah, there there's some things though uh, when you when you think about opera, it's not something to go into just blindly. You know, obviously, if study if you it have, a little. If you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. You know, send yeah. us send us a note on the website or on Facebook or whatever. If you want to know about opera, first thing, first time opera, there is a wealth of information that you can find on opera on YouTube mm -hmm. on the Met Opera Player. They uh, offer, you know, gosh, uh, since what was it seventy. Oh, I don't know. 76, 76 when they did the first PBS production. Yeah, with the Bohem. So there's there's lots of stuff that they uh, filmed and recorded uh, that they have for rent, and it's only four ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the, it's worth the, watching. the the library that they have of, oh my gosh, of material. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, horror. Uh, Bluebeard's Castle. Oh my gosh, that was incredible! Was phenomenal, was absolutely incredible. And uh, you know the entire ring cycle is breathtaking. Yeah. Uh, there's Doctor Atomic. Yeah. Uh, which is you know all about the development of, of the atomic bomb. So th there's there's something for everybody out there. You know both in you know fictional, historical. Uh, check, check. You know the opera is. It really needs to be investigated. It's really I think. diverse. It's very diverse. There's a lot to look at and yep. a lot to enjoy. Absolutely. And as always, we have follow-up items. Check out our calendar on the website. There's birthdays, events, cons, film festivals, etc. If there's something on the calendar that you or that you feel should be on the calendar, send us a note. We'd be glad to put it on there. We are support, huge supporters of independent creators, whether they're filmmakers, comic book artists, writers, or other. We found that there's a tremendous wealth of talent out there of independent creators that are doing it because they love to mm -hmm. do it. They don't get the big fame and fortune. Sometimes they want to create something, and it costs a little money. They can't do it out of their own pocket, so they'll ask uh, crowds to do crowdfunding, shall we say. And if you can, if you hear about a crowdfunding opportunity, please su consider supporting it. You can usually do that for as little as a dollar. You never know. It might turn into something big. Support independent creators. Phoenix Comic Con, May 25th through the 28th, 2017. Back on Memorial Day weekend. Less PTO to take. Keep checking phoenixcomiccon.com for info. There's tickets available, and I think there's still some hotel rooms available. The, I think the so. The slate of guests are incredible this year. Yeah, there's, it's huge Just this year. And, unbelievable. And we we do know that they did open up uh, the Crown. Crown Hilton, I think it is. or uh, I, I, I think what it is. Uh, yeah, there's but there's a third hotel now for, for taking con uh, convention guests. Yeah, and there's also... Um, Phoenix uh, Comic-Con Fan Fest is coming in November 11th and 12th, 2017. More info to come. They're also doing Thrill Halloween. Yeah. And that's uh, October ooh, 1st and 2nd, I think. It's early uh, October, it's I believe. It's early October. I, we'll get the dates and stick that in the notes. I forgot to do that this week. But they just announced that. In fact, after we had already talked to Matt this week, uh, they had announced that like Tuesday or Wednesday. So check it out. They've got lots of stuff going on. And, of course, in October this year by Arizona Opera, Opera Con, prior to Hercules versus the Vampires. Oh, It's another one of those things that, you know, there's horror. This is the 1963 Mario Bava film, Hercules and the Underworld, set to music. It's going to be an absolutely incredible. We're That's going to be amazing. I yep. cannot wait. We're going to do OperaCon beforehand. There's going all kinds of events planned prior to the production. And so, details will be coming. Yes, details will be coming. We're they're in the process of planning that right now. Yes. Special shout out to Doctor Who Talking Who. They are on Twitter. They publish the Doctor Who Fancast Guide. And if you wish to read the Fancast Guide. You can find them on Twitter. They are at Talking Who. And uh, same thing with 
Nazi punching scald. He's our good friend Brian Weber. He posts the Arkle Times Post Dispatch News, and you can find him on Twitter. He is at Arkle. And the only reason we bring them up is because they like to publish our stories, and yeah. we're forever grateful. And Thank you. also check out uh, Arkle's incorrect Star Trek Voyager quotes. You can find that on Tumblr. Special thanks also go to Sci-Fi Obsession for republishing our stories. They can be found at Facebook.com slash Sci-Fi Ob. That is S-C-I-F-I-O-B. And always a uh, shout out to The Lucky Show, The Twins. They really give us lots of love on, on Twitter, and we appreciate that. They are um, have their Twitter, at Lucky Show, as well as their YouTube show. It's called Lucky Show. They do uh, reviews of old movies, not just old movies, but... Uh, some new movies. Some even. new movies, but they do it kind of in a campy and really fun style. Check I want, out. I want out them, Lucky Show. I want them to review Hercules in the Underworld. There we go. I hey, want I want to see that. That would be great. That would be great. Do that for us, guys. Yeah. That'd be lo- we'd love that. Yep. Special shout out to the Facebook group, The Gay Geek, for allowing us to post our episodes on their page. And, and it's an awesome page with awesome content and very awesome people. You know, it's not... Just, it's not that the fact that they allow us on there. It's really a really, really good group, and we like it a lot. And you can find them at facebook.com slash groups slash the gay geek. And as always, the greatest of thanks to their moderator, Jeremiah Reeves, for saying, okay, share your stuff here. Yes, thanks, Jeremiah. We want to remind you to occasionally click on our Amazon ads. You can find those ads at the bottom of each article, as well as uh, little widgets on the side of the website. Don't have to buy anything. Just click on the ads. Tell Amazon we're getting some traffic to them. But if you do choose to buy something, use one of our search ads, and we get a little bit of a kickback. Thank you for your consideration. And please, last but not least, please rate us on iTunes. Oh, please rate us on iTunes. We really could use that. Thank you. Well, we don't know what's coming up next week, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to have an interview with Mr. Clint Borzoni and Mr. John De Los Santos. They were the uh, composer and the librettist, as well as uh, stage director for Copper, Copper Queen, Queen, which was uh, a premiere premiered here in Arizona. It was written for Arizona Opera, commissioned by Arizona Opera. And we're going to talk to them here in a couple yes, of weeks. Yes, and that one kind of feeds into that whole thing about what geeky stuff opera has to offer. Exactly. Okay, that should do it for this episode of TG Geeks Webcast. Be sure to check out the article for this webcast episode. We're going to have a couple of links on the page. And remember, you can comment on our Facebook page or our website, tggeeks.com. Or you can leave a voicemail at 469-TG-GEEKS. That is 469-844-3357. From TG Squared Studios, I'm Keith Lane. Thanks for listening. I bid you peace. Cheers.